Welcome to Superior Presentation Skills with John Kendi. Join me now as I share ideas on how to strengthen your presentation skills. Thank you, Patsy. Are you aware of the advantages of being a dull speaker? <laughs> dull speeches are easier to write. They're easier to give. As a dull speaker, you'll be called upon to speak less often. <laughs> but the biggest advantage of being a dull speaker is nobody will listen to you. We only get into trouble when people listen to us. But seriously, if we can't afford to be dull speakers, can we? Because people, uh, they've been watching television. They've seen the best. They've seen the very best. They've seen music and comedy and Michael Jackson. And they're comparing Michael Jackson to you. So we need to do what we can to improve our speaking style so we can compete with that. People have become somewhat, somewhat jaded. Dr. Albert Moravian said that 7% of our effectiveness comes from our words. 93% of our effectiveness or believability comes from our voice and our body movement. Now, that's not to say that our words aren't important because our words are critically important. But what happens is, if we don't have the physical delivery, we'll have those beautiful words and people can't hear them while they're sleeping. <laughs> or we'll have those beautiful words and we deliver them and people won't believe them. So we have to have the physical delivery to go with it. And then they can hear the words. Delivery is like a window. Think of delivery as a window. When the window is polished, it's one thing. But when the window is not polished, you see it, don't you? But when the window is polished, it fades away and the message stands out. Delivery is like a window. It isn't a speech, but bad delivery can distract and good delivery can help get your message through. Delivery is like a window. I also like to say that good delivery skills will give you the illusion of competence. <laughs> Well, have you ever seen politicians? Slick speakers, huh? And then they get in the job and they can't... Somehow their, their job isn't the same as their speaking skills. The illusion of competence. But consider the flip side of that. If you don't have the speaking skills, it gives the illusion of incompetence. You go for a job interview and you're nervous, and you've got the job skills, you could do the job, you could be a good supervisor, but you come across as incompetent because you're nervous. We have to get a handle on our nerves, our use of voice, our use of body for effective delivery so we can magnify the impact of our confidence and our competence. It's so important. I call that the, the illusion of competence. But we all have stress when we get up and speak and the book of lists tells us that one of the biggest fears is speaking in public. You've all heard that and the only way to get over that really is to speak is to get up and to speak I remember when we moved to California many years ago in 1957 we lived near San Francisco and whenever we take a trip into San Francisco I noticed that if my dad was driving he was not nervous if my mother was driving she was very nervous driving in San Francisco for a good reason with the hills and an old 57 Pontiac and the difference was, my dad drove all the time. And my mom normally didn't drive. So here they were in San Francisco, a new environment for both of them. My dad hadn't driven on those streets before either. But he had driven a lot. And he could handle a new situation. Same with speaking. You basically need to speak and speak and speak. And then when you go to a strange situation, you'll be more comfortable with it. Join a Toastmasters club, it's like going to a gym. I know we have some Toastmasters in here. And those that aren't Toastmasters, it's like going to a gym to work, work out those muscles. And you need to do it to improve your speaking skills. Well, let's look at controlling nervousness before the event. What do you do before the event? Well, besides joining a Toastmasters club, volunteer. Do you belong to a church? Do you belong to a civic club? Do you belong to a PTA? And they're always looking for someone to do a program, to do a speech, to read a report. Volunteer. Remember that the speech begins in the parking lot. Bob Orban says that. I heard of someone once, they said they, and this was about a month ago, they said that they heard of a, or they saw a speaker 
They arrived in the parking lot and the speaker was in the parking lot changing his pants. The speech begins in the parking lot. You're making an impact. You're making an impression out in the parking lot. And you want to practice ahead of time. Hopefully you've come to the room ahead of time. We were in this room last night. We were walking around. We sat in the seats. We sat someone in front to see how they, if it would block visibility for eye contact. Practice with your real notes in the real environment if you can. It's important to help control nervousness and get ready. When you come in, you check out the, the lights, you check out the sound system, you make sure that everything is working all right. And then you greet people when they come in. You see what happens is if you're here early, you own the room. It's your room. And when you greet them coming in, see how different it is than if you, get, if you arrive late and you walk into a room full of strangers? You welcome them to your room and then hopefully have some quiet time afterwards. Take a walk, breathe, and relax. And then you get up to speak. So to control nervousness, you want to start out by starting out slow for control. Establish some eye contact. Look for a friendly face. Before you get up on the stage, find somebody that's having a good time. I look over there and I see Diane. I see Diane's already smiling. So I'm going to look at Diane when I start my speech. Especially if you're opening with humor. You might want to open with humor because humor relaxes you. Many things you can do. Shake hands with the audience. You do that in your speech by saying you're glad to be here. What an important group. What great work you do for the community. That's shaking hands with the audience. Helps to build bonds. Helps to control nervousness. During your speech also, consider that nervous energy is just that, it's energy. So it's a question of what do you do with the nervous energy. It can translate into shaking paper, shaking knees, shaking voice, or it can translate into movement, huh? that's energy, gestures, that's energy. It's a choice on what you do. So you can translate your nervousness into some movement, into some gestures, into some listening skills. Doesn't it take energy to be a good listener? Have you ever had a listening exercise where you had to practice being a listener to someone? So if you're focusing on the eye contact and the listening skills, that takes some energy. So you can direct some of the energy that you have, some of the nervous energy, into physical skills, into physical delivery. But your attitude's important in controlling nervousness. And a lot of it's perspective. I knew a woman who went over to Italy and she wanted to close to the Riviera and she wanted to wear a bikini. But she was very self-conscious in a bikini because she had never worn a bikini. And she went down to some of those Italian beaches for a couple weekends and most of the people were topless. And it changed her perspective after a couple of weeks. <laughs> she was able to wear a bikini. No sweat. You see, it changed your perspective. And sometimes we need to do that in the speaking world as well. Have you ever been to one of those karaoke bars where they have the video and the sing-along? There's a support group somewhere in the country where they, they practice singing in front of each other. And on graduation night, they go to a nightclub and they sing in front of strangers. If you can sing in front of strangers, you can speak in front of strangers. And if you can get up at a, at a karaoke bar and sing on one of those video things, it breaks down some inhibitions, it changes your perspective, makes it easier to get up and speak in front of people. So a lot of it is tied into perspective. Also remember that if you're nervous, it's your secret. If you're just a little bit nervous, it's not even going to show. If you're really nervous, it'll show just a little bit. So it's your secret. Remember the audience is on your side. Have you ever sat there in the audience watching, waiting for a speaker to come up thinking, oh, I hope this speaker forgets his lines. Oh, I, I hope this speaker bombs. I hope no one laughs at his jokes. You never think that. The audience is always on your side. So remember that. The audience is on your side. And perspective, when you, when you come up, you know, I'm prepared. I've got good material. I look good. I'm wearing my one of my expensive ties, whatever. And you might visualize some things like visualize a standing ovation at the end of your talk. Visualize that you just won the gold medal at the Olympics. How would you look? How would you look? You feel pretty good. Visualize that the audience is naked. Now, if they're naked, why should you be nervous? 
I don't know if that works for you. It doesn't work for me, but but there's some books there's some books out there that suggest that. Try it, and if it works for you, then then go with it. Okay, attitude, and it's your message and your focus. Patsy talked about the various levels. Level one is focusing on yourself. To get away from nervousness, we move up to level two, the message. We move up to level three, the audience. And the more that you're message focused, the more that you're audience focused, the less you're going to be nervous because you're not thinking about yourself and what other people are going to be thinking about you. But what's the biggest fear that makes people nervous? I think it's, what if my mind goes blank? <laughs> Let me give you some tips on what if your mind goes blank. Tip number one is, they don't know what you're going to say until you've said it. So if you say something differently, or you leave it out completely, they're never going to know. Really, huh? think about that. So, also, what you want to do, if your mind goes blank, remain calm. <laughs> Easier said than done. But experts in self-defense, they say if you're mugged, what you need to do is... You have to breathe. What happens is, when we go into a panic mode, our mind goes blank. We stop breathing. And we don't get any oxygen to our brain. So we have to remain calm if we can, at least look calm. We have to take a breath. Don't look up. That's a giveaway, isn't it? Or down. Just look at the audience if your mind goes blank. Use the last phrase you said and restate it. In other words, that makes sense, doesn't it? You just said something, well, in other words, and say it again. And then your mind's racing, thinking of where you're going. Or use the last word as a seed. Maybe the last word was inflation. Inflation is really tough for us to handle. Do a table topic. <laughs> use the last word as a seed for an impromptu speech, and then it will come back to you. It will come back to you. Do an internal summary. An intro. Well, so far we've talked about nervousness, and we've talked about attitudes, and we've talked about this, and we've talked about this. And it will come back to you. Or you can say to your audience, oh, I've got something I want to read to you. <laughs> and you pull out your notes. <laughs> they think it's a quote, maybe. <laughs> Why not? Or... You uh, go over for a drink of water. You know your mind's blank. <laughs> they think you are thirsty. <laughs> and the longer your mind is blank, the more thirsty you are. <laughs> or just level with the audience. Have you seen speakers do oh, My mind, where was I? What was I just saying? You can do that. And that's better than standing there saying nothing for 15 seconds. Just level with the audience. So there's some coping strategies. And if you know that you can cope with your mind going blank, you're going to be much less nervous when you get up on the stage. Doesn't that make sense? You've got some strategies that you can use. And once you control your nervousness, the big thing that I really want for you to think about is don't confuse confidence with competence. That can happen. Have you ever seen a preacher, or a teacher, or a speaker who was confident and they were having a good time throwing their arms around and speaking, but they weren't a good speaker? They were boring and they needed to work on maybe on their humor delivery or on their gestures or on their vocal variety. <laughs> Never confuse confidence with confidence. Just because you're relaxed up here, you've still got that challenge to take another step to get a little bit better. That's what the seminar is about today. Taking just a little step. You don't take organ lessons today and play the organ tomorrow for your friends at a party. And you don't take golf lessons today and go out tomorrow and shoot par, par golf, do you? And you don't take a Spanish language class today and run down to a Mexican restaurant and order your dinner in Spanish tomorrow. Well, you don't listen to a set of tapes, you don't come to a session like this, and it doesn't change you overnight, but it's, we work on that competence all the time, just taking another step up the ladder. I want to move into the areas of physical delivery. 
And the first area is voice. We're going to look at voice and then we're going to look at the body. In the area of voice, well, that's what's, what you're doing with your voice. Rate, pitch, volume, force, pauses. Makes a difference on how you say things. For example, if I said, I went to a small town, I visited their library, and they had three million books. Or I could say, I went to a small town, I went to their library, and they had 30,000 books. 30,000 books sounds like a lot more than three million books. See the difference? It makes a big difference on how you say things. And one of the keys with vocal variety is not that you're using high pitch or low pitch or loud or soft or fast or slow. The, the key with vocal variety is how you change your vocal pattern. Looking for opportunities to change what you're doing. To go from loud to soft, from fast to slow. And that's one of the challenges in, in a speech. If you have a set speech or a briefing that you give, you look for opportunities to plan some vocal variety. It's a mechanical way of doing that. Experienced speakers would never write that in their notes. Here I want to speak slower, here I want to speak fast. But it's a good way to plan ahead. Eventually it becomes more natural, but by planning it, you give some thought to it. You give some thought to it. Vocal variety. Other things you can do for vocal variety. Practice reading out loud. Specifically, plays and poems. Plays and poems are meant to be read out loud. And if you read out loud every day for 15 minutes, it'll make a difference in your clarity and your diction. And it will help. Some people will read from the Bible at church. Some will read the minutes at meetings. Make the minutes interesting. Read children bed children's bedtime stories. You can really get into it and, and talk the part of the dragons and all of this and get excited. I just love reading children's bedtime stories. And I can imagine how much fun it would be if I had kids. <laughs> practice on the telephone. Have you ever called an office and they answered the phone and you not only could tell what their name was, you could not tell what the business was because they said it so fast? It happens all the time. We get sloppy on the telephone. Practice on the phone. And practice smiling on the phone because the smile helps bring out helps bring out your character, your <laughs> friendliness. I didn't tell you I'm a ventriloquist. And this is my dummy. <laughs> That's one way of speaking without notes. You have someone in the audience that will prompt you, and that works, works quite well. Tape record your speech. Obviously, you tape record your speech. Here's what I recommend when you tape record your speech. When you play it back, it's hard to listen for everything. So I recommend what I call focused replay. And as you play it back, you look at the areas of vocal variety, rate, pitch, volume, force, and pauses. And you listen, not to the whole thing, but listen to part of it. You say, rate. I'm going to listen. Do I speak faster or slower in any part? And you may find out you have no rate variety at all. Pitch, highs and lows. Volume, loud and soft. And listen for one thing at a time. Focused replay. And that will show you where you're really lacking in vocal variety. It's a good technique on the tape recorder. You can say something for vocal variety, you can say something as, as, as though you just thought of it. Isn't that a great idea? It can make a difference in your vocal variety. Say something as though you just, it just occurred to you. It makes it sound more fresh. And that's a technique to add some vocal variety. Use tongue twisters. Use tongue twisters for practice, not in your speech. <laughs> Vocal variety. Also, with your voice, what you can do is start out slowly. Now, some of these things tie in together because starting out slowly was part of nervousness, too. If you start out slowly for control and make contact, if you start out slowly with your vocal variety, it gives the audience a chance to relax and to get used to your voice, especially if you have an accent, especially if you speak fast. So starting out slowly really covers a lot of things in speaking. The area of body and what you do up here, and I'm going to 
bring a couple of people up. We're going to try a couple of other experiments with people. I'm going to have them give a short speech, about a 20 second speech up here on the stage. And then I'm going to step out in the hall just briefly and they're going to come back in and do their speech again. And we will talk about that briefly. We're going to talk about some of the physical things that take place. And uh, let's give a big hand to Manuel. <laughs> I've been speaking for 20 years, I've been a Toastmaster for four, and I've started to learn the last four years. I've learned that it takes a while to come up and to actually enjoy and make sense. You can usually get up and speak and say things, but to make sense, to make it enjoyable, there is a day off of Toastmasters. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Manuel Lerma. <laughs> Toastmasters does make a difference. It makes you a better communicator. You're able to reach the audience. You're able to go into the minds of your audience. And it just works for everyone. If it works for you, if it works for your audience, then you've done your job as an effective communicator. Thank you. Okay, any differences? Yes. Did you okay, tell them to imagine the audience naked? <laughs> <laughs> Did I tell him to imagine the audience naked? <laughs> Well, no, I didn't tell him that. He might have been doing that. I don't know. <laughs> okay, besides, he obviously, he laughed at the start. Besides that, the content, the flow, how he sounded, the difference. The second time, I felt like I was being proselytized. You did. I didn't like it much. You didn't like that, okay. I'm just more relaxed the second More relaxed the second time. I see a head, and a head nodding there. Okay. More passion the second time. We'll get to that. More passion the second time. More passion the second time. I liked the laugh better than asked for a glass of water, but I thought what he, his content, what he's talking about, didn't really go with the laugh the second time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. The water was inside. That's a, that's, a, that's a good comment. The laugh didn't go with the content. Yeah. No reason for that. He seems more involved in it the second time. Seems more involved in the second more time. Involved. I hear more positives than negatives. That the second that the second presentation was shorter. Was better. Well, it was shorter. I cut him off. But. Okay. Here's what I told him. I, I went out. We went outside and I said, I want you to imagine that you have told the funniest joke in your life on stage and people have been laughing for the last 30 seconds and they just can't stop they've been laughing because your joke was so good in fact you almost can't control yourself now i didn't know he was going to get up here and laugh for as an opener but that's that's how he chose to do it but with that mindset what can happen is it changes people will usually smile more now he's got a mustache so a smile's going to be harder to see on manual but just a little change in mindset Maybe as an opener, before you get up there, and I have trouble smiling. I don't smile a lot when I'm up on, on the stage. But as a gimmick, before you come up on the stage, you might visualize that everybody's been laughing so hard at something you just said. It just can't, you can't help but smile a little bit. And it changes, you notice, it changes voice, changes confidence, it changes lots of things. When you work on the basics, it will change other things. So I wanted to do just a couple of exercises just to show you on how just a couple of small changes can in fact change the perceptions say that it changes in fact many things and it changes things in physical and, and body language as well moving into the area of body it's important that we use good physical delivery good body delivery people will see what you do before they hear what you say that's a good rule of thumb and that's why in the study it showed that 55 percent of your effectiveness comes from what you do with your body 38 percent your voice but 55 percent what you do with your body people will see what you do before they hear what you say I did a program at a deaf school and a deaf student came up to me and he told me he said John he said I really don't understand something he said I'll watch people hearing people 
and I'll watch them tell a joke and they'll stand there with a perfectly straight face and tell a joke and all of a sudden everyone will start laughing. He says, I can't understand how you could tell a joke with no physical expression. And if you watch deaf people tell a joke, that you can see it in their face, their face lights up. That's a good way to study body language is to take sign language classes with a deaf person, ideally, because they're very, very expressive. And the question is, sure we can tell a joke with just the words, but why would we take the, the impact of the physical and just throw it away? Why would we want to do that? So we need to work on the physical and take a lesson from the deaf student and not speak and tell jokes and give speeches without using the physical delivery. So the first thing I want to cover in using the, the body is eye contact. And I want to give you two thoughts for eye contact. The first one is we need a motivation for eye contact. Why do we, why do, we do eye contact? We, to connect with the audience. I think a really easy thing to focus on is we do eye contact for feedback. We don't do eye contact because the book says we should do eye contact. And then we just spray the audience with eye contact. And boy, I'm, I'm good because I'm looking at all those eyes out there. That's what happens when we focus on our material sometimes. We sit there and we just spray that eye contact like a broadcast fertilizer, just throwing it out there. But the purpose of eye contact is feedback. And I'm listening. I'm listening and I'm watching to see if you're hearing what I'm saying and understanding what I'm saying. And it also it helps control nervousness, we talked about. It. it takes energy to really get the feedback and to focus on people. And secondly, I encourage people to be conversational with your eye contact. Genuinely have a conversation with one person. I don't say, make two or three seconds of eye contact and then move to someone else. What are you supposed to be doing? Uh, 1,001, 1,002. <laughs> Just complete a thought. Complete a whole sentence or a whole phrase or something to one person. And then you move to someone else. And you're really, you're visiting with one person at a time. And then you move to somebody else. And you make your eye contact conversational. Here's an exercise you can do in a group. If someone's having trouble with eye contact, and if you're going to be giving a, let's say, a short one to two minute presentation or a speech, Everyone sits in their chairs and the speaker has to make at least three seconds eye contact with everyone in the room. This works with a small group of maybe 15 to 20 people. Once I've made 15 to 20 seconds eye contact with, with Glenn, he'll raise his hand. I have to get everyone's hands up. The exercise is called hands up. And if it's a longer speech, then you make three seconds eye contact more with Glenn and he puts his hand down. You get the hands up, you get the hands down. It forces everyone to make extended eye contact with everybody in the room. It's an exercise, and I call it hands up. When speaking, again, know your opening. You can establish eye contact if you know your opening, because you're not tied to your notes. You're able to make some eye contact. You need to avoid glasses that are really reflective or glasses that appear to be sunglasses when you're up front speaking because people can't see your eyes. You need to cover the entire room with your eye contact. If you're at a head table and you've got people sitting to your right and left, you don't spend your whole speech, but occasionally I will always make contact with the people at the head table, occasionally, and not leave anyone in the room out, or if there's a balcony, or if the lights are bright and you can't see people in the back, you imagine where they are and you just visualize the eye contact, especially with the people in the back. It's easy making eye contact with people in the front. With the people in the back, you can't leave them out, and eye contact will bring them in. If you have no cards on a lectern, one technique to maintain good eye contact is drop your eyes instead of your head when you're looking at your notes. Another technique is if you have quotes, instead of having, having them written on your notes, have your quotes typed on cards, and you can pick up your quote card and read it. You see it's up, it's up at eye contact level when you're doing that instead of down on the lectern. Eye contact is so important. The area of face. I'm going to give you a couple of quick ideas on face, moving from the eyes down to the face as a whole. If you want to practice your eye expression, you can cut a rectangle out of a sheet of paper 
that you can look through into a mirror and see what your eyes are doing when you think you're expressing happiness and surprise and anger and fear and disgust and practice expressing emotions. And then I ask you again, do you smile when you speak? You need to smile, it adds face value. It is important to smile. Moving down to gestures. There's a fellow in a hotel and he went to the registration desk. He wanted to pay his bill and check out. He had a check. Cashier said, well, you have to sign your, your name and you have to write your name and address and your phone number on the check. And he says, I'm not going to write my address and phone number on the check. I don't have to do that. And the clerk said, well, you have to do that. I can't cash your check. He says, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sign my address and phone number. And, and so the clerk said, well, go down and talk to the cashier. The cashier is down there in the cashier's cage. So he went on down to the cashier's cage and the cashier said the same thing. He says, well, you have to sign your address and your phone number on the check. And he says, I'm not going to do that. And the cashier reached through the cashier's cage, grabbed his necktie, and slammed his face up against the bars. He said, you have to write your address and phone number on the check. And he said, okay, okay. <laughs> he wrote it, passed the check, she gave him the money. He went back to pay his bill and the clerk was at the registration desk and the clerk said, oh, she cashed your check. You must have written your address and phone number on the check. And he said, well, yeah, I did. And she said, why did you write your address and phone number on the check for the cashier and you wouldn't for me? And he said, well, she explained it better than you did. <laughs> she used the same words. She used different physical delivery. She decided to reach out and touch someone. And you do that with physical, with physical delivery. So looking at gestures, it adds impact to your words. A gesture is a manifestation of a thought. All too often, a gesture is sometimes mechanically linked as though hooked by a wire to your words. And when you're talking, you just, you, I call them hand thrusts. It's just your hands are thrusting and they're thrusting, but they're linked with your talk, so you know, you're gesturing. But they're not necessarily a manifestation of a, of a thought. There's a difference. And are you expressing what you're saying and using meaningful gestures that manifest a thought? Do you move with a purpose? There can be several things to moving with a purpose. Moving from point one to point two. I move from the left to the right. Moving from point two to three, I move from the right to the left. Making a positive point, I move forward. Making a negative point, I move backward. Okay? I move forward to connect with the audience. I move backward to let them relax. I move backward to summarize. You move with a purpose. I make eye contact over here on the right-hand side of the stage. That gives me a reason to walk over there. I make eye contact. And it gives me a reason to move. Moving with a purpose. I make eye contact on this side and I move back to this side. Move with a purpose as opposed to just talking and just wandering back and forth across the stage and pacing. You want to move with a purpose. You need to have a neutral position. You need to feel comfortable just standing there with your arm just loose in the shoulder. Because in speaking you need to use pauses because people need a rest occasionally and this is the same. This is a visual pause. Instead of just waving my hands around all the time. It's a visual pause. Practice in front of a mirror. Practice in front of a coach. Find out what works. And, and really, a loose arm looks good and looks natural. Tell me, what looks more relaxed and inviting if I walk around like this, talking, or if I walk around like this? Do I look relaxed and comfortable? Is there a difference? And I've got my arm cocked at 90 degrees sticking out. And sometimes there's a tendency to walk around like this and walk around like this in praying mantis, holding the microphone in two hands. But if you just have a neutral position, let that arm just swing from the shoulders and just relax. You need to extend your gestures occasionally. If you gesture everything from the elbows, you'll look like a seal. I recommend this as an exercise. Take an imaginary orange, put it under your arm. Take another imaginary orange, put it under the other arm. Occasionally, you need to drop an orange. You need to extend those gestures once in a while. You need to drop an orange. Have you ever seen speakers with rings under their arms? It's orange juice. <laughs> squeezing those oranges. And you need to drop your oranges occasionally. And that helps give you extended 
perhaps some slower gestures, some rounded gestures, some smoother gestures. You need to do that. If you tend to use a lectern, speak without a lectern. You need to get away from the lectern. It allows you to use your gestures when you're not handcuffed with a lectern. You need to be aware of handcuffs, and a lectern can be a handcuff. White knuckles. Other handcuffs, rings, if you play with rings. A pointer can be a handcuff. Pockets can be a handcuff. Is hand in pocket a gesture? Yeah. Sure it is. A rule of thumb is a gesture is a gesture if it's extended, if it's on purpose. For example, what if you're touching your glasses a lot? It's a nervous habit. But compare that to the person who reaches up and holds that, or maybe takes them down and looks over the top of his glasses. That's a gesture. See the difference? An extended gesture is a gesture, and something else may just be a nervous habit if you're going in and out and playing, playing with your change. So beware of handcuffs. To practice your gestures, tape your speech, play it back, and practice it lip sync. Like Millie Vanilli? in front of a mirror and since you don't have to work on content you can practice gesturing and moving and smiling and making impact it's a technique you can use if it works for you video your presentation it's a great way to have feedback how many have videoed yourself before? most people have seen themselves on video so a lot of you haven't it's a treat you'll see yourself and you'll say oh my gosh I don't look like that and you find out that Looking natural on stage does not come natural. It's a lot of work. But with video, here's a couple things you can do. Play the video back with the sound off and ask yourself the question, how interesting am I to watch with the sound turned off? It's a good question. Play it back at double speed. And here's a clue. If you don't look like you're moving much at double speed, <laughs> guess how much you're moving at normal speed? a good technique. Some things you can do with video to see exactly how you're doing. And while you're watching the video, look for repetitive gestures. We all have the tendency to do the same gestures. We'll give a speech and we'll do the same gesture 30 and 40 times. And there are thousands of gestures we can do and explore some variety. And these are all things that I'm working on as well to improve my physical delivery. Repeat a speech. You can give a speech over. If you give sales presentations, that's great. You can give them over and over and over. And since you know the content, since you're repeating it, you can focus on the physical delivery. If you have to give a speech over again, focus on the physical delivery. Annotate your notes for delivery. Here's where I might do this. Here's where I might do that. It's a mechanical way, but for starters, it helps you put some gestures on purpose into your program. Very important. You might visualize for gestures that you're standing in a window or a door. If you're speaking with an extremely small audience standing next to a conference table, you're speaking in a window. They see from the waist up. So the most important gestures are your hands and your arms and your face and your smile and your eye contact. If you're speaking to 300 people and you're on a stage, you're standing in a doorway. They see your whole body. So if you're moving, if you're moving, if you're bending your knees and leaning forward, if the question is, are you standing in a doorway or are you standing in a window, it tells you where you need to focus your gestures and your movement. Just a gimmick. Here's another exercise that you can do with a group. I call it competition exercise. You get two speakers that come up front. And you stand in an imaginary 12-inch circle. Both speakers. And they both speak at the same time for 30 seconds. And when it's over with, the group talks about which one was more effective, which one got the attention, and why. Was it the vocal variety? Was it the fact that maybe they uh, said your name, Bob? Did that drive you in? Was it, was it the volume? Was it the arm gestures? It's a good exercise in physical movement of what works and what doesn't work. Competition exercise. And, of course, you can always try to be outrageous and break down some of the barriers by giving a speech and sobbing and crying and pounding on the lectern and breaking down some of the limitations 
that you have. Here's some, here's some tips for gestures when you're speaking. Some quick tips. Number one, I call it on your mark, get set, go. As you're being introduced, don't sit back in the chair and relax and enjoy the introduction. You need to scoot up on the front of the chair. You need to make sure your zipper's zipped, your slip's pulled up, your coat's buttoned, your tie's straight. You need to be ready to go, smile on your face, and when you're introduced, you head for the lectern. You prepare yourself to get up there. And that's part of the physical thing, part of the physical delivery. On your mark, get set, go. Physical delivery can be enhanced by positioning visual aids around. You may have something that you're going to pick up over here. You may have a flip chart over here. If you don't want to walk around, you don't have to do that. But you can position your visual aids to help you move around the platform, give you a reason to move, and that helps burn up some energy and give you some physical delivery. You might need a coach, someone in the room who'll stand in the back of the room with little feedback cards. Maybe you say, ah, a lot, or you know, or you do not speak loud enough or too loud and they can give you louder or softer, thumbs up, thumbs down. They can have little signs in the back telling you what to do. You need a coach sometimes. They can tell you if the sound system is working properly. And a coach is great for a sound system. And I want to move just briefly into the use of the microphone because I think it ties into physical delivery. It's something to hold. I prefer a handheld mic because it gives me something to do with at least one hand. A lot of people like a handheld mic because it gives you some... Otherwise, you've got two arms hanging on it that you have to figure out what to do with. But I also like it because it gives me more flexibility if I want to talk softly or I want to whisper. And sometimes a whisper will draw people in. In a lavalier mic, you don't always have the same flexibility as you do. Or if you want to shout really loud, you can, you can drop the mic down. So I like using a handheld microphone. If you're the master of ceremonies and you introduce someone, now if I introduce Patsy Dooley, and she's about a foot shorter than I am, I should lower the mic stand before she comes up. That's not her job, that's my job. And then when she comes up, if she doesn't want the mic stand in front of her, which she probably doesn't, she would grab the mic stand below the adjustment ring while she takes it out and she'll move it behind her and set it behind her while she's talking and gets it out of the way. If you grab it, ab grab it above the adjustment ring, you may end up with a mic stand that's 10 feet tall. That happens sometimes if the adjustment ring isn't set really firm. So you grab it below the ring. And just before you're finished talking, you move it back around. You finish it, you're getting ready to wrap up. And before you wrap up, you go ahead and you place it back in and you make your final concluding comments. And when you're done, ladies and gentlemen, it was a pleasure to be here and you walk off as opposed to, ladies and gentlemen, it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. I saw a speaker do that once and he couldn't get it in the ring and he just, he laid it down on the table and it went clunk and he walked off the stage. Okay, so that's a technique. When you're passing it around or putting it in and out or if you have one of those gooseneck microphone stands that make a lot of noise, use the on and off switch on your microphone. That'll help eliminate some of the distraction, some of the noise. If you get feedback, you're on a microphone and you get feedback, normally what you need to do, it means that you just stepped underneath a speaker or you just stepped in front of a speaker, all you need to do is reverse your direction. If you're getting a little bit of feedback, go back to where you were. And the feedback normally will stop. Otherwise, you need a technician in the room to take the gain down just a little bit. If you get feedback, reverse your direction a little bit. Look, look out for P's and B's and popping in the microphone. All those little things. Don't overpower the mic. You need to practice ahead of time before you get up there, find out how the mic works, how it sounds. And what you can do is watch the speaker ahead of you. How are they holding the mic? Are they holding it like an ice cream cone and talking right into it? And is that working? Or are they overpowering the mic? Or is it about chest level? And sometimes you'll see that speakers are holding the mic all the way down at waist level and it's picking up just right. That's a clue that maybe that's a good place for you to hold it. Coach in the back of the room can tell you how the mic's working. If you use a lavalier, if you're wearing jewelry, you need to watch out. And you clip that lavalier on, you don't want it clattering against a necklace. Handling a microphone. Handling notes. Best to speak without notes. 
However, you, there may come a time where you're giving a speech that's an hour long and you're giving 101 ideas and you choose not to leave something out. Better to use a few notes, cover all the material, but don't memorize a speech. If you need to give a speech word for word, read the speech. Just read it, do a manuscript. If you're doing a speech uh, for a company, it's a PR speech, something just blew up outside the factory and you had to give this because it was approved by the lawyers, read it. Just read it. But when you memorize a speech, you get tied into the exact words. And when you miss a word, it's hard to get started because you need that exact word and that exact phrase. And you're better off working from an idea outline. But you may want to work from cards if you're working from notes. Type them in big letters, triple space them. Take them on cards and move the card. Set the cards on the right hand side of the lectern. Take the top card and move it to the left and set it down. You then have card one on the left, card two on the right. It reads like a book. From left to right. You go through card one, you go through card two. Halfway through card two, I tell a joke and everyone laughs. And while they're laughing, I slide card two from the right to the left over on top of card one. So when I get to the bottom of card two, I'm not obligated to move the card at that point. And then I finish card two and I move over to card three. And at a logical place, I slide. I don't flip it over. I slide card three over. And you're always one ahead. You're always a step ahead with your note cards. But the best way to do it is have an idea outline. And I'll give you two suggestions working with an idea outline that helps you give your talk without notes. Number one is you practice with your idea outline. So if you give your speech with the idea outline, you will notice that after three or four practice sessions, you will be able to visualize You'll actually be able to visualize the, uh, the physical outline. You'll be, uh, uh, when I do it, I'm able to see exactly what's on note card number. I know what's on the top of note card number two. It'll work that way. You practice with your idea outline. The second idea is you write your idea outline by memory for five days in a row, once a day. You write it out. And that will help commit it to memory. And once you have your idea outline, it is no problem at all speaking without notes because professional speakers speak in vignettes, little short stories of three minutes or five minutes or seven minutes, and all they have to do is string together a few vignettes and the memorization is almost non-existent. Now, I'll give you some tips, that, things that you can do for speaking without notes that I call crutches. If you use visual aids, in this case I'm using a handout so it's not applicable, but if I have a flip chart, guess what? It's got your idea outline on it. It's a giant note card. If it's an overhead transparency, it's a giant note card up there. And you can speak from your visual aids. And it's very easy to speak without notes. If you have a flip chart, you might have your notes in pencil. No one can see the pencil except for you because you're close. You might have the notes on the back of the flip chart. You might have your notes on the frames of the transparencies. You might have your notes on the props that you have. You might have your notes on the floor. Lots of places that you can put your notes. You might have notes similar to this. These are notes. It's a manuscript. It's a script. Keywords are highlighted. They're highlighted at places where I typically need help jumping into the speech. This is something I'd used many years ago. But my idea outlines on the right hand side. If I need the words, they're on the left. And they're hooked together. They're in acetate protector sheets and hooked together with steel metal rings. And if it's laying on the lectern, and I go through page one, and when I get to the end of page one, I flip it over. And the back of the note side is a visual aid for the next page, laying on top of the lectern. I go through the next, it's my idea outline, it's my text. I get to the bottom, I flip it over, and it moves me on to the next page. And it's combining lots of things. It's combining a manuscript, it's combining an idea outline, it's combining visual aids. It's all in one compact package to walk up and just set on the lectern and use. So that's an idea. A couple of things, and I call these crutches and speaking without notes. Remember President Bush was in the uh, debate, the last debate, and he, he looked at his watch. And that a lot of people had noticed that and it looked like, boy, when's this thing going to be over with? 
But if you're speaking, it doesn't look good if you look at your watch. There's two things that you can do. If you're, let's say you have a hard time when you have to finish your speech. Let's say seven minutes. You use a watch with hands. You take your watch off. And you set the watch at seven minutes before midnight. And when you get up to speak, you set the watch on the lectern. You don't have to worry about when you started. Or when you're stopping, you're stopping at midnight. If you're talking for a half an hour, you set it at 11.30. And you glance down there and it's really easy to tell exactly when you're supposed to finish without having to worry about what time you started and ha having to add seven minutes or 30 minutes to it. Another thing that you can do, you can have a clock which you would buy at a stationery store. These are only $10. They're battery operated and I use it every time I speak. Sometimes I set it at the back of the room. Sometimes I lay it on the floor at the stage. I just glance over and I see the time without having to look at my watch. This is what I use personally. I call it a crutch. I call it like a note card, like a hidden note card. Because when you speak you're concerned about time as well as you're concerned about content. In closing, I want to encourage you to be a student Always be a student. Have you ever taken a drama class? They're available. They're available here locally. Drama 104 at the local college. Have you taken a speech class? They're available here locally. Speech 101. They do have a very good speech instructor over there. I just finished the course. <laughs> and I recommend that also. Have you ever gone for coaching? There's a coach up in the Bay Area. His name is uh, Jim Richardson. He's a comedy coach and a speaker coach. In the last month, I went, up and went to one of his workshops. There's a fellow named Max Dixon from Seattle, a great body language coach. And I was fortunate enough to spend a weekend with him a couple of weeks ago in Sacramento. There are people who can give you coaching. Toastmasters can give you coaching. I knew someone when I, when I went to Berkeley. I went to school at UC Berkeley, and he was known by the students as Holy Hubert. And he was an evangelist and he stood out there by Sproul Hall preaching to the students. There were always people out there trying to attract attention. He would attract 50 or 60 people. And some of the other speakers wouldn't attract hardly anybody. Well, if you're a student, you're going to analyze what the difference is. If you're a fisherman's wharf and everyone's watching one mime, but they're not watching another, or they're not watching the juggler, what's the difference? Is it physical delivery? Is it humor? What's the difference? Be a student. If you're sitting in a, a program and the speaker is deadly boring, isn't that terrible? No, it's great. You say, wow, what a boring speaker. How could he improve? What if he were paying you $500 to give him one tip that would help him? What would you tell him? Analyze with someone's a boring speaker rather than going to sleep analyze why they're a boring speaker. If you're sitting in a car, what a great opportunity to watch people gesture because you can't hear them. You can study the gestures in a distance and see how they're moving naturally. We all gesture nicely naturally. It's when we get on stage that we forget how to gesture because it's so awkward and we're nervous about doing it. Go to a silent film and watch gesturing in silent films. It helps, keep, helps to keep us from being a dull speaker. We really don't want to be dull speakers. We want to work on our physical delivery, on our nervousness, on our voice, on our body language. We want to take those little steps up the ladder. That's all they'll be, little steps. But next year will be many steps up that ladder if we keep working on it. And it makes a difference so that people hear our words, so that we make a difference, so that we connect with people, so we sell our ideas and sell ourselves. We get further in life by using physical delivery skills. So I wish you the best of luck, but most of all, I wish you good speaking. Thank you.